All right, Wind Power students, welcome back. Um, we're on the third part now of our lecture about the variables and forces that work in the Earth's atmosphere, and we're kind of working our way through the list of forces that our textbook talks about. Remember, the textbook actually talks about each of these in like one or two paragraphs. It's just not enough information at this time to uh, make meaningful progress on like the reasons why the wind blows and why it is the strength that it is and so on. So um, as we are working our way through our list of forces here, the next one is the frictional force. Um, Friction, of course, is a process that is always acting to slow motion down. You slide a box across the table, it, friction will slow the motion down or whatever. Um, we kind of lump a lot of processes actually together into this term friction when we're talking about the atmosphere. It isn't all really friction as to what is slowing the motion down. A lot of it is more what we would call drag. It's just the resistance of air to flow around objects and so on. It's not necessarily mechanically or physically the same thing as friction, but we're going to lump it all together and call it friction. Um, just to kind of tell you what I'm going to tell you before I tell you, um, friction really is only important in terms of the way the air interacts with the ground. In terms of like air rubbing against air, like if there's, oh, there's some cold air moving south, but it's going to slow down because it's going to have friction with the warm air it's pushing out of the way or something. No, air rubbing against air, we're not going to be worried about friction. It's, it's the interaction with the surface of the earth that we're worried about. Now, when we're trying to depict friction when we're trying to like draw the vectors that are uh, all the different forces that are creating the acceleration of the wind according to Newton's second law and so on, then we're going to always draw fr friction as being exactly in the opposite direction of the velocity vector. So like here on this little map here, I've made a velocity vector at that location pointing straight to the east, therefore at that time the friction vector is going to be drawn straight to the west, okay? Now, I'm, this doesn't yet tell you anything about like r the relative magnitude of the friction, but at least we always know its direction is indicated as being like opposite the motion. Friction doesn't make things turn to the left or to the right, it just slows down their motion. Now your book provides a somewhat helpful way of mathematically expressing friction where they're saying the friction vector, F vector, could be thought of as just negative A times the velocity vector, V vector. And I guess that would be one way to think about it. I mean the negative sign means that it's going to be pointing in the opposite direction and A is some kind of friction parameter to use the terminology of your book, and I have never seen it written that way before because, I mean, the reality is friction depends on a lot of things. You can't just kind of say, oh, and the friction parameter is 0.3. No, it doesn't work that way. I mean, it's going to depend on lots of stuff like the roughness of the underlying surface. Since friction is going to principally be about how air is interacting with the surface of the earth underneath it, well, Roughness matters as to how much friction there's going to be. If the air is flowing over, say, a relatively smooth lake, there's going to be less friction than, say, if it is flowing over a city where there's buildings and billboards and power lines and trees and so on that are all acting to create friction with the surface. Um, in general, even like over the ocean where there's waves, the friction and the roughness of the surface is going to be less than, say, over land. In general, land has things like hills and trees and power lines and billboards and all terrain and all kinds of stuff that is going to be acting to slow the wind down more than you're going to see over land. I'm mean, sorry, over the ocean. Um, but, okay, that, so like, that's something that would go into that friction parameter A. Um, another one would be the altitude above the ground. Friction doesn't just affect the air literally touching the ground. As we're going to learn over the course of the semester, that friction, that slowing down the wind, is actually communicated upward. You know, air 100 meters above the ground is experiencing friction with the surface, even though it's not touching the surface. That's one of the ways we can tell that this idea of friction is sort of more an idea. Clearly, somehow or other, turbulence and aerodynamic drag and so on are all going to be kind of folded into this idea of friction as a force that's slowing the air down. But the farther and farther you get up above the ground, the less you have to care about friction at all. In fact, once you get up above the top of the boundary layer and up into the free atmosphere, we don't worry about friction at all. In fact, that's a, that's not a bug, that's a feature. We're going to be able to describe the winds above the top of the boundary layer without friction, and that's going to turn out to be a simpler way that will give us insights into what the wind is doing, but we'll get there. Now, I wrote here as our third bulleted point that another thing that would be hidden inside of that A, I wrote here it's the stability of the atmosphere between the surface and the given altitude, we're trying to figure out the amount of friction. Um, we're going to learn a lot in this semester about what stability means and how that affects the winds and so on, but suffice it to say it's a property, okay? It's something that we are measuring when we're describing the atmosphere and trying to figure out what the winds are doing and so on, and I mean, it's a property that can change, 
it's different today than it was yesterday, it's different now than it was six hours ago, etc. And that means that even at the same location, even at the same altitude, the amount of friction being experienced by the air is going to change, you know, hour by hour, day by day, etc. because of the properties of the atmosphere changing. We're going to have changing, in this case, stability of the atmosphere that is going to be changing the ex extent to which the winds there are experiencing friction. And in fact, there's a whole laundry list of other factors that go into our idea of friction in the Earth's atmosphere. And so this, um, in fact, that's a lot of what this course is, considering that all of our wind power turbines and so on, even the airborne turbines, don't extend outside of the boundary layer. And so we're going to need to be worried about how friction is affecting the wind and so on. It's actually kind of an important theme in the whole course. Uh, so this friction parameter A, I mean, I guess it's kind of a nice symbol at this point in the course. Uh, but we're clearly going to find better ways to write this than this sort of symbolic, oh, I'm just sort of affecting the velocity of the wind by friction and lumping together drag and stuff like that into there too. So that's not so helpful yet, but it will be. We're going to get there. Now, our third force on this list is the Coriolis force. And let me tell you, every atmospheric science professor dreads teaching about the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force is not terribly complicated in the sense of, like, its effect on motion. It actually turns out to be pretty straightforward. The problem is it's really hard to explain it. And there actually happens to be an attempt in pop culture to explain such a thing. If you're a fan of The Simpsons, you know where I'm going with this. Uh, there's a great episode of The Simpsons. They're all great episodes. What am I kidding? Um, there's a great episode of The Simpsons where Bart notices that the water always goes down the toilet the same way. And he tries to make the water go the other way by grossly sticking his hands in the toilet and so on. And then Lisa, the, the scientist, the logical person, explains to him that, no, that can't be the way it's going to work because they live in the Northern Hemisphere. And in the Northern Hemisphere, the Coriolis force means that the water will always go down the toilet the same way. And what, Bart gets on the phone with Australia to see if in the Southern Hemisphere the toilets flow the other way, and uh, it, hilarity ensues. Um, it breaks my heart to inform you that The Simpsons is not your best source of science information. L Lisa has many things wrong about it. The Coriolis force is not the one reason why toilets flush the way they do. Uh, but uh, it is true that toilets in the United States do all flush the same direction, but that's a plumbing thing, not a, uh, and a manufacturing of the toilet bowl thing that has nothing to do with the Coriolis force. Um, so what is the, but, but to her idea that, like, motions that turn in a consistent way must have something to do with the Coriolis force, that's not, the writers of The Simpsons were not miles off in that idea. So let's talk about the Coriolis force and what it really means. Your book uses this term, fictitious force, says that the Coriolis force is a fictitious force. That's a very alarmist term. I wouldn't call it a fictitious force. Most textbooks use the word apparent force. There is, strictly speaking, a difference between apparent forces and true forces. Uh, pressure gradient force, gravity, they're true forces. Um, fr friction uh, is a true force. Uh, friction, the Coriolis force is a, an apparent force. Um, Strictly speaking, it isn't actually a force. Strictly speaking, it's actually about a change in moment, angular momentum. Um, but as it happens, it has the same units as a force, and it has the same, just like any other force, it, it results in an acceleration when you say force per unit mass. So we treat it like a force, okay? Don't get bogged down on the fact that it's not a true force. The frictional, I'm sorry, the Coriolis force happens because we live on a planet that is both round and rotating, which right off the bat should tell you that that's not a tremendously exotic thing, but it took us a long time to figure out why this was happening, and it has to do with the fact, that both the shape of the planet and the fact that the planet is rotating. Let me tell you what the effect of the Coriolis force is before we try any attempt to like explain it or something like that. The Coriolis force is a weird force in the sense that it can only act on objects that are in motion. I don't know that there's any other forces that work that way. We're only on, they can only, maybe centrifugal force, come to think of it. Um, but in general, forces can act on anything they damn well please to. This Coriolis force can only act on objects that are in motion. And it is stronger the faster the object in motion is. So the Coriolis force will always be stronger on a fast-moving object. We're going to talk a little while about things like snipers, bullets, and so on. Okay, they're moving fast. They have a stronger Coriolis force. Things that are moving slower have a weaker Coriolis force. Things that aren't moving have no Coriolis force. It's a weird thing also about the Coriolis force that all it can do is change the direction of motion. The Coriolis force cannot change the speed of the motion of any kind of object, including the, the speed of the wind or anything like that. 
again, we'll get there, but just to kind of give you a little summary before we talk about all of these details, the Coriolis force is zero at the equator. It doesn't matter how you're moving at the equator, there's no Coriolis force. And it gets stronger and stronger the closer you get to either the North Pole or the South Pole. All right, what does the Coriolis force actually do? The Coriolis force deflects motion. It deflects motions to the right of the direction that they were going in the Northern Hemisphere and to the left of the direction they were going in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, let's be clear about this idea about to the right. I mean, as in, in the direction the object was moving. So, like, you know, if you're talking about the bullet coming out of a sniper's gun, it's going to deflect it to the right of the motion of the bullet. Not to necessarily the, the, the sniper's right, not necessarily to the right of the target, not necessarily to the right on a map, to the right of the direction it's moving. In the southern hemisphere, it's going to deflect motions to the left. If we're going to be talking about, you know, analyzing the forces at work on, you know, a volume of air or whatever here, I, I want to show you how you're going to actually draw or depict the Coriolis force. So here on this map, I've made, I guess, six little volumes of air there labeled those black dots. And I've made them so that they each have different motion. Actually, four of them are all moving straight from the west to the east at the same speed, but just at different latitudes. And two other ones I have just in the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, and they're moving at a faster speed. And that gives me a chance to draw a total of six different Coriolis force vectors, one on each of those. When we draw a Coriolis force, you always want to draw the force so that it is 90 degrees to the right of the motion of the velocity in the northern hemisphere and 90 degrees to the left of the motion in the southern hemisphere. And in fact, if you take a look at this map here, the one over Greenland, the one over Antarctic, I'm sorry, over the Atlantic Ocean, the one over China, you can see that the three I have in the northern hemisphere, I drew the Coriolis force 90 degrees to the right of the motion. And in the southern hemisphere, you can see I turned all those vectors around so that they are 90 degrees to the left of the motion. I want you also to notice that the, mo that the Coriolis force vector, I drew it longer and therefore the, a stronger Coriolis force vector for the motions that are faster over China and over the Indian Ocean than those slower motions like over uh, the Atlantic Ocean and Greenland and so on. The stronger the motion, the faster the motion was, the stronger the Coriolis force is going to be. Now it's a little bit subtle, I have, didn't have a lot of room to work with on this, but uh, notice too how there's a dependence on latitude. So like for that one that's in the Atlantic Ocean, see the length of its Coriolis force vector? And then go up to the one that's at uh, over Greenland. We're at a higher latitude, we're closer to the North Pole, and I made the Coriolis force longer, even though the, the wind speeds were the same. At a given wind speed, the farther, the closer to the pole I got, the stronger the Coriolis force was, the closer to the equator I was, the weaker the Coriolis force was. Okay, so a little diagram kind of gives you a sense of how to sketch the Coriolis force here. The Coriolis force does not just act on winds, although winds will be an important example of the Coriolis force, but any object that just sort of gets sent off in a direction on its own is going to be affected by the Coriolis force. Like, for example, this missile that I have here on this map here, where apparently some West African nation is launching a missile north towards, I don't know, England or something like that. Here I have the missile. If I just aimed that missile north, I know London is straight north of you know, some West African country, I aim it there and I shoot it straight north thinking I'm going to go and, you know, bomb England or whatever here. Here's the deal. You won't hit England. As the missile goes, just gets to shoot straight to the north, the Coriolis force is going to deflect the motion to the right. Not to the right of the page, although in this case it happens to be, not to the right of the person doing the shooting or anything like that, to the right of its motion. So the missile's motion is going this way, it'll get deflected off to the right, and in fact the missile will end up blowing up somewhere. I, in this case I just sort of drew it like Eastern Europe instead, completely missing its target. Any motion is deflected by the Coriolis force. In fact, by the way, if you if the motion just continues, if you don't do anything, to, you know, if they have that missile just had plenty of rocket fuel and just kept going and going and going, it would make a big circle. And that's actually like an interesting phenomenon, and the amount of time it would take to make that big circle is an interesting phenomenon, and so on. All of which I would love to teach you in Atmospheric Dynamics 1 and Atmospheric Dynamics 2, but we're not going to go that way in this class. But the shape of that, it would make a circle, and in fact, if at any point along the way you thought about it, you put the rocket at some location on that path and said, oh, its direction is this way, I see the Coriolis force is 90 degrees to the right, so it's going to get deflected to its right, and you'd see how it makes a circular path over the flight of that rocket. Okay, um, the same would be true of in the atmosphere. If you just pushed a volume of air and no other forces were acting on it, the volume of air would move in a big circle too. In practice, that never happens. The atmosphere is not that undisturbed. There'd be other things going on. But it does happen in the ocean. If 
some process displaces some volume of water and you somehow can track that volume of water like you have a drifting buoy floating in it or something like that, the water will make a little circular path over a course of, you know, um, a period of time. Again, the amount of time is called a pendulum day. We'll worry about that some other day if we ever need to. Wow, we got this weird Coriolis force out there. How come we don't discover this? How come we don't notice this in our day-to-day -day lives? Coriolis force was discovered by, uh, well, was mathematically explained by Gustav Coriolis uh, in the mid-19th century. Um, if you drift around on the internet, you'll find out that this was discovered based on the Napoleonic Wars and how cannons were shooting, and in fact, that's all apocryphal. None of that actually happened. Uh, the Coriolis force was actually... Uh, early understanding of it was actually even before the Napoleonic Wars, and, Cor and Gustav Coriolis' uh, explanation has nothing to do with cannons and so on, despite the fact that even I've used that story in you know, like intro classes before. But in our day-to-day -day life, we don't tend to notice the Coriolis force. Um, I mean, how come I don't notice when I throw a paper airplane that it curves off to the right? Or when I hit a baseball that it curved off to the right, or something like that? Um, the Coriolis Force is not going to be responsible for why the ball went out into right field, or why uh, when you uh, played golf you sliced it off to one side, or something like that. See, here's the deal. Most of the motions in her day-to-day -day life aren't really all that fast. Okay? When you hit the golf ball, it's not really going all that fast. When you shoot the basketball, it's not really going all that fast. And remember, the magnitude of the Coriolis force depends on the speed. So if the object isn't really moving all that fast, the Coriolis force exists, but it's not really all that much of an acceleration. So it isn't actually changing the velocity all that much per second. And how many seconds is the ball in the air when you shoot for the hoop? There just isn't time for there to add up to enough of a Coriolis force for you to notice. It's real. It's a problem that they do in Atmospheric Dynamics 1, where they actually compute, like, how far did the basketball move, and the one second it was in the air, how far to the right of where it was originally going was it going. It's like, you know, fractions of a millimeter. They're, you just wouldn't notice it, okay? So an object would have to actually be in motion for a really long time for this small Coriolis force to actually add up to enough that you could notice. If you're talking about a relatively slow motion, like the wind, the object is going to have to be in, you know, that volume of air is going to have to be in motion for a long period of time before this makes a, 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 a enough of a deflection that you notice it. Well, fortunately, the air is just in motion all the time. I mean, we'll be able to notice it because, I mean, it, it has all the time in the world to act on the coil, to have the Coriolis force act on it. Now, what about relatively high speeds and objects that are moving relatively fast? And the example that is classically used on something like this is like a sniper's bullet. Imagine a sniper is, say, a thousand meters from his target, and he fires the bullet. Well, the bullet is moving pretty fast, and speed is one of the factors that determines the magnitude of the Coriolis force, so there's going to be a relatively large Coriolis force acting on, say, that bullet. Um, okay, great. Same with, like, the missile that we were talking about earlier and so on. On the other hand, just how long is this bullet going to be in the air? Or, um, you know, any other fast-moving object you'd be thinking of. Uh, they're just not going to, yeah, the, the magnitude, how many meters per second the, uh, the, the velocity is changing, the acceleration, uh, how much it's changing every second, its acceleration, is pretty big, but how long is that bullet in the air? A second or something like that. So even though the magnitude of the Coriolis force on something like a bullet is fairly large, the hang time just isn't very long. So the actual mag amount of deflection on something like a bullet isn't all that much. In fact, in this example here, uh, we worked through the math, and it turned out that a sniper's bullet deflects a few centimeters to the right over the course of, uh, of a, of a one-kilometer path. Um, so it takes something, you know, if it's moving fast, it's going to have to be in, the, in motion a long time. Something like a ballistic missile or something like that uh, for uh, us to actually notice the Coriolis force. A better question is, why does the Coriolis force exist at all? I mean, this is such a strange idea, this idea that motions are deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere, and so on. And I have some animations that I've made about this, but they're currently on a hard drive that recently failed, and we're in the process of trying to figure out if we can recover them and so on. If they are, I'll give you links to show you these animations and so on. But the core idea of the Coriolis force is that it's about conservation of angular momentum. Now, when you were like in high school uh, physics classes and things like that, you learned about conservation of angular momentum using like a like a spinning chair or something like that, where like they had these demonstrations where uh, maybe a student had some books way out, uh, some side to side like this. Uh, they sat on the spinning chair and they made them spin slowly. 
like this, and then they pulled their hands in, and they would spin more rapidly. That's called conservation of angular momentum. You know, like, for example, when you watch the Winter Olympics and the ice skaters are doing, you know, if they put their hands out, they spin slowly. If they pull their hands in, they spin rapidly. That is actually behind the scenes of what's really going on in the Coriolis force. It's part of the reason why it's not a true force, it's an apparent force, because it's not really about a force, it's about changing the angular momentum. How that results in a deflection to the right is very complicated to explain, but I can give you an example to think through that will kind of, oh, I guess I wouldn't have thought about that kind of thing. Let's say I was standing at the North Pole, and I am a fisherman. If I am standing at the North Pole, I am currently turning. I am going around the axis of the Earth once every 24 hours. Now I'm going to try to catch a fish, and the fish is, well, I guess by definition, south of me if I'm at the North Pole, right? I'm going to cast my line, and I'm going to catch that fish. Now that fish is right now not moving. He's just there in the water, too. He's not here at the North Pole with me, and he is going around the axis of the Earth once every 24 hours, just like I am. Okay? If, if I catch that fish and start reeling him in, as I pull him closer and closer to me, it's just like the figure skater pulling her hands in. It's just like the demonstration you saw in high school where you were spinning. He's going to start, just like the, the, those things were spinning faster, that fish is going to start going faster around the axis of the earth than he was before. As I reel that fish in, he's going to be going faster and faster and faster around the axis of the earth. It's no longer going to take him 24 hours to go around the axis of the earth. I mean, I'm picturing here, I'm not like just casting a line here. Imagine I can really cast that thing and I've cast it, you know, hundreds of miles or thousands of miles to the south or something like that. Okay, so I'm bringing this fish in across lots of latitude lines. All right, so isn't that odd though? I mean, I would have thought that that fish would get pulled straight up a meridian, straight up a longitude line from where he is straight up toward me. But in fact, the fish is getting, as he goes faster and faster around the earth, he's getting pulled. And in fact, if you work through thinking through it from the point of view of the fish, he's getting pulled to the right, right? It seemed like he would come straight up the latitude line, but because he gets all the way around the earth and more in 24 hours than we did, then he is getting pulled, you know, every time he goes around the axis of the earth, he's a little farther to the right than he was before. All right, so it's kind of a hard thing to think through, and again, we have some animations that if I can get that hard drive fixed, I'll put up for you. But the idea here is that it's about this idea about how over long motions, over long periods of time, result in these changes in uh, conservation of angular momentum that act like a force. It's not exactly the same thing as a force, um, but it has the same units of a force and so on. It results in a change in acceleration and so on. And so we treat it like a force, but it gives physics majors chest pains because they know it's not a real force. All right, mathematically, how would we talk about this all mathematically? Now your book actually bothers to put there a very mathematical vector definition of the Coriolis force, where the Coriolis force is negative F K hat cross V. Now, depending on what math and physics classes you've had and stuff like that, that might just scare the crap out of you. But let's think this through here. This F is a number called the Coriolis parameter. It's just 2 omega sine phi, where omega is the rotation rate of the Earth, and sine of phi, phi is the latitude of the Earth. So this is just a variable that kind of scales. Uh, it'll be F is 0 at the equator. It's as big as it's going to get at the North Pole. It's as big and negative as it's going to get at the South Pole, etc. It's, it's a number that appears all over the place in atmospheric sciences. Uh, but in this case, it's relating to the strength of the Coriolis force. K-hat, that might be something you've never seen before. K-hat is a vector, and it is a vector that's defined as pointing up. These hat vectors, there's I-hat, J-hat, and K-hat, are vectors with a length of just one, and they point in three um, normal directions. I-hat points to the east, uh, J-hat points to the north, and K-hat points up. So it's just, a, it's just a definition here. We're just defining k hat is up. And v is going to be our velocity vector at any given time. Now the question is, what is this x? That little cross there is called the cross product. And again, depending on what physics classes and what math classes you've had, this is either a big deal or it's not a big deal. Um, the cross product is actually a real pain in the butt to compute. Uh, it certainly can be done, you do it in math classes and so on, but to just give a sense of what the direction of the cross product is, you use the so-called right-hand rules. Now, I put a piece of clip art there that shows how a cross product works. 
you take your right hand, and the way they're teaching it here is if you're trying to compute A cross B, you point your uh, pointer finger in the direction of A, you point your middle finger in the direction of B, then your thumb is pointing in the direction of A cross B. Okay, there's actually, if that is not the way you learned it in like a calculus class or something like that, um, another way to do cross products is uh, your thumb points in the direction of the first vector like A, and then your middle finger, uh, your ring finger, after your pointer finger points in the direction of B, and then your middle finger points in the direction of A cross B. Whichever way, it turns out that's part of the reason why it's useful to use your right hand. It doesn't actually matter how you do these rules exactly. So we'll use the way this clip art does. So let's think about what that means for the Coriolis force. If we're moving, let's say, forward, okay, k hat cross v. So uh, our first vector is our pointer finger. It's pointing up. Our second vector, it, which is v, is going to be our uh, middle finger pointing off to the side here. So let's turn our hand so it points the right direction. So let's say our vector was pointing toward the camera here. Then our thumb points in the direction of k hat cross v. Oh, well, wait a minute, that's actually to the left of V. V is pointing toward the camera, my thumb is pointing towards the left of the motion. Oh, but there's a negative sign in front of here. So if this is a, the negative of the Coriolis force, then the Coriolis force is this way, which is to the right of that direction. Oh, okay. I don't know. I'm not sure that this, again, if we were in ATS 571, Atmospheric Dynamic Meteorology 1, we would be making 100% certain you had every detail of this. I'm not sure this is necessarily the most important point right now is the mathematics of how to deal with the Coriolis force, but it's certainly a thing. We can make that work if we need to. All right, before we go on to our last couple forces, let's talk real quick about a couple, three quick questions here. Question seven. At a given wind speed, the Coriolis force will be stronger, A, at higher latitudes than at lower latitudes, B, at lower I'm sorry, altitudes, rather. A, at higher altitudes than at lower altitudes. B, at lower altitudes than at higher altitudes. C, at higher latitudes than at lower latitudes. Or D, at, at lower latitudes than at higher latitudes. Oh, my. What a tangled question. At a given wind speed is the key, though, to the question there. Which of those is the right option to explain at a given wind speed when the Coriolis force will be strongest? All right, make a choice from those four options and get a little feedback before you move on to question eight.